I'll just go ahead and start this and we'll get going because I got a ton to cover. Imagine that. But I'm going to go slow. We're going to be calm. And we're only going to cover what we can cover. Is that okay? Amen. Say, yeah, right, Chris. Whatever. <laughs> I, I got a joke for you. And I've shared this joke before. It's been a while. Some of you may have heard it. If, if uh, you've heard it, let's laugh, everybody. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. It's very funny. Uh, Naomi had this on her Facebook, so I thought, you know what? I, this is a really funny joke. I need to do it again. So it's, it's called The Perfect Husband. This is awesome. That's a good joke. I love it. It says, several men are in the locker room of a golf club. A mobile phone on a bench rings, and a man engages the hands-free speaker function and begins to talk. Everyone else in the room stops to listen. The man says, hello. The woman says, hi, honey, it's me. Are you at the club? The man says, yes. The woman says, I am at the shops now and found this beautiful leather coat. It's only $2,000. Is it okay if I buy it? Man says, sure, go ahead if you like it that much. The woman says, I also stopped by the Lexus dealership and saw the new models. I saw one I really liked. How much? The man replies. The woman says, $90,000. The man says, okay, but for that price, I want it with all the options. The woman says, great. Oh, and one more thing. I was just talking to Janie and found out that the house I wanted last year is back on the market. They're asking $980,000 for it. The man says, well, then go ahead and make an offer of $900,000. They'll probably take it. If not, we can go the extra $80,000 if that's what you really want. The woman says, okay, I'll see you later. I love you so much. The man says, bye. I love you too. The man hangs up. The other men in the locker room are staring at him in astonishment, mouths wide open. He turns and asks them, does anyone know whose phone this is? <laughs> The moral of the story is be careful when you leave your cell phone here. <laughs> Things can happen that you don't want to happen. Amen. I've entitled this. Now, let me explain something. On the sign out front, it says license to win. I was going to call it grace, colon, license to win. But, you know, I got subheadings and some of my subheadings are longer than what we can get on the sign. So that's why there's uh, sometimes there's an apparent discrepancy, uh, but it, there really isn't. The, the title of this message is actually, What is the Sin Unto Death? Because in 1 John chapter 5, it talks about a sin unto death. Okay, and I'm going I'm to get there. It's going to be just a bit before we get there. And now someone would say, are you talking about blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? I am not. That's a whole other thing. I'm not, we're not even touching that right now, okay? One was before the cross and one was after the cross. And I realize that even now, people, there, there is a blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about what John referred to as the sin unto death. It's important that we know these things. You know, God did not put stuff in the Bible so we wouldn't know it. That's a deep revelation, isn't it? Well, some people say, well, it doesn't really matter if I know or don't know that. Uh, uh, it just doesn't matter. It does. Amen? Uh, some people say, well, what you don't know won't hurt you. I, I like to tell people sometimes what you don't know could kill you. <laughs> Amen? Like when I was... Uh, a uh, junior in high school, I remember I was painting uh, at a factory and uh, was scraping on, on a, what they call a cherry picker. And I was up in the air and these electric lines were on and I did not know it. And what I don't know won't hurt me, right? <laughs> it almost killed me. Amen. But anyhow, so spiritually that same thing is true also. So I've entitled the message, What is the Sin and the Death? We're going to we're going to kind of go and lay a foundation, then we're going to go there. But I want to start with Mark chapter 4, verse 24 from the Amplified Bible, if that's okay. Mark 4, 24 from the Amplified Bible states as follows. Very good verse. This is Jesus speaking, amen? And he said to, unto them, be careful what you are hearing. Well, you could camp there. That's not just talking about uh, uh, Bible teachings, although that's certainly included, and, and that's part of it. But just be careful what you're hearing in general. Amen? Uh, I think of some of the medications they sell on, on uh, TV, and if you ever get a chance, go online and watch Tim Hawkins. He's a Christian comedian, and he, he does a real funny blip on uh, the side effects of medication. You know, for a short, sore arm or whatever, take this, then you read it, you know, could cause nausea, could do this, and eventual death, and that type of stuff. And he goes, man, my shoulder feels good. But then he, he's 
all the side effects. Amen? So here's my point. What he says, be careful what you are hearing. Amen? It says, the measure, and, and this, this is where it comes on our plate. See, some people have this mindset that God does everything and we don't have a part in it. We do have a part, and it's a very big part. Our part is never to merit or earn anything. Jesus did all that. But our part is to receive what Jesus has done. But I love this. Be careful what you are hearing. The measure of thought and study you give to the truth you hear. The measure, a measure is, a, is a, an increment of how much, okay? The measure of thought and study you give to the truth you hear will be the measure of virtue and knowledge that comes back to you and more besides will be given to you here. Man, that's awesome. The measure of thought and study, the measure that you give to what you're hearing. In other words, how much you put in to receiving what you're hearing. I, I will give you an example. I have to take truths that I hear and I've just, I've really got to meditate them in, but not just mentally. I pray. I like to pray, pray in the spirit and walk and meditate on things that God's given me. But I have to and so do you. See, this is why if you don't do this, you become spiritually dull. There's a lot of Christians that are spiritually dull. God loves them. And they'll say, oh yeah, God loves me, I know that. Knowing is not just intellectual knowing. How many of you know there's a difference between the way I know my wife and the way I know some pro football player? You better hope so. <laughs> I'm not talking about, I'm talking about just the, the level. Even the way I know some of my friends, I know them personally as opposed to knowing some celebrity that I've never met before that I can read all about them and I can tell you about them, but I don't really know them. God wants us to know Him. And how does that occur? The measure of thought and study you give to the truth you hear. That in, that, that's how you get to know God. Amen? That's a very major part of how you get to know God. See, I don't want to just know about God. I want to know Him. I want to know Him. Man, that's my heart's crying to just really know Him. Amen? I, I, the, the longer I live, the more I hate religion. Because it, what religion is, is it's settling for a form that denies the power of the new birth, that denies the power of relationship. That's what settling is. Now, let me give you another one. Luke chapter 6 from the Message Bible, verses 46 through 49. It's laying a foundation before we get to the sin unto, the, unto death. And, and I'm laying this foundation because as you hear this, I'm going to challenge you to begin to take these verses that we look at and begin to allow the Holy Spirit to revelate them to you. Amen. Amen. That's good. I love this. Now, this is so good. Message Bible, Luke 6, 46 to the end of the chapter, verse 49. Why are you so polite with me, Jesus speaking, always saying, yes, sir, and that's right, sir, but never doing anything I tell you? <laughs> Sounds like raising kids. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Next verse. These words I speak to you are not mere additions to your life, homeowner improvements to your standard of living. Boy, keep this up here. They are foundation words, words to build a life on. Boy, if people could get that. I mean, do you, do you realize that when, when God revelates the word to you, that's a revelation of Jesus? Do you hear what I just said? See, Jesus is the word. I'm not talking about ink on paper. But when you get a revelation, all of a sudden you see something in the Word, you're getting a revelation of Jesus. Do you know how you can tell how much you love Jesus? How much do you love His Word? You know how much you can tell how much you know Jesus? How well do you know His Word? Amen. See, we think, we still got this in our head sometimes where we think that knowing Jesus is separate from His Word. It is not. He is His Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. John 1, 1, verse 14 says, That word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father. See, as you, as you allow the Holy Spirit to revelate the word to you, it becomes you. Amen. That's why sometimes I know that I know that I know that I get so excited about the word of God. Because it's Jesus. I'm seeing Jesus. Amen. You are too in the word. But see, these are not, I love this. These words I speak to you, they're not mere additions to your life, Home, homeowner improvements to your standard of living. See, so many in our culture, I love America. I really do. I love this country. But so many of us think that, that well, it's all about me. No, it's not. A, it, it, you're, the, you're blessed, but it's about him. It's about his purpose. 
It's about what He wants. And all of a sudden, what He wants becomes what you want because you're one with Him. Amen. How many of you let your children, if you have children, or I know we all were at one time, hopefully your parents just say, well, you just go eat as much candy as you want and you don't ever have to eat anything right. And no, we got to eat good food, amen? And so we have to understand that this, the Word of God is not just, you know, mere additions to my life. It is my life. In Him we live and move and have our being. Amen? That's why the psalmist said in Psalm 119, verse 162, I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure. Wow. Great spoil, the old King James says. Great treasure, the new King James. Great treasure. Do you rejoice? Have you found it? Yeah, I found it. I got the Bible. I've heard that before. Have you found it? Is it a revelation to your heart? God's got so much for you. Listen, I, there's one thing I dread. I do not want to exist. And I want to, creator of the universe lives in me. I want God to be able to make a significant difference in this world because I was here and he lived through me. And that's your purpose. That's, that's in you too. <laughs> Amen? The Lord showed me something one time. He said, if people do not understand on the inside what I have done, if they don't get a revelation of that, they will look on the outside for what they're not experiencing on the inside. And I've seen people look on the outside and the whole time it's in Him. No matter where you're at, Christ is with me. No matter if you have mountains or flat places or hills or ocean or Lake Larmy or whatever you have, it's awesome because you're in Christ. Amen. Hallelujah, I like that. These words I speak to you, they are not mere additions to your life, homeowner improvements to your standard of living. They are foundation words, words to build a life on. Next verse. If you work the words into your life, if, powerful two-letter word, if, if. See, we have a part. We have a part. We have a part. Our part's not earning. Our part's receiving a finished work. Amen? If, you work the words into your life. You are like a smart carpenter who dug deep and laid the foundation of his house on bedrock. When the river burst its banks and crashed against the house, nothing could shake it. Leave this verse up here. It was built to last. Notice it doesn't say if the river. If, uh, when the river burst its banks, not if the river burst its banks. If you've been alive more than a week or two, you've probably had a trial. <laughs> we live in a fallen world. Amen? And so things will come at us, but where have we built our foundation? Where have we, have we allowed the word to get into us? This is why people get offended many times, because they're not grounded in Christ. When you're, another Psalm 119, verse 165, great peace have they which love thy, thy law or thy word, and nothing shall offend them. Amen? <laughs> Nothing's going to take you out. Hallelujah. Glory to God. If you work the words into your life, you are like a smart carpenter who dug deep and laid the foundation of his house on bedrock. When the river burst its banks and crashed against the house, nothing could shake it. It was built to last. It was built to last. Now, if you're born again, you're going to heaven. But you know God wants you to get heaven here. <laughs> and that comes through relationship. Amen. Are you built to last? See, the parable of the sower, he talks about some people they endure for a while because they have no root in themselves uh, when tribulation comes for the word's sake. The devil don't care about you. He's after the word. Amen? Immediately, they're offended. Amen? All right, hang with me. So, next verse. Say, I'm built to last. I'm built to last. Amen. That's what I like to hear. But if you just use my words in Bible studies and don't work them into your life... <laughs> Don't you love the way it words in? You are like a dumb carpenter who built a house but skipped the foundation. Well, we're going to talk about foundation too. A lot of people have not really got the foundation laid in their life. Amen? We need, the, we need a solid foundation. You know, a building's really only as good as its foundation. Okay, it says, When the swollen river came crashing in, it collapsed like a house of cards. <laughs> it was a total loss. Amen. Say, that's not me. Because I'm, I'm working the words in my life. Oh, there, there's that cuss word again, words. It's not a cuss word. I got a, you may see on the sign eventually, maybe next week, I don't know. But I got another message the Lord has 
given me called Dead or Alive. And that's not a Bon Jovi song either. Okay? It's talking about there's works that are dead and there's works that are living. Amen. And your works are God's idea. Even Adam had a job before the fall. Amen. To tend the garden. You were created to do. A lot of times it's been said, I don't know the statistics on it, but a lot of times when people that have been very work, worked hard and been very active all their life, when they retire, many times they, their health deteriorates because they stop doing. But people that retire and stay active, a lot of times, and are doing something, they maintain their health. Why? Because we were created to do. No one, God never created anyone to coast. Amen. All right. Okay, my next. I want to go to, um, I want to show you this. I want to say just a couple words about the foundation. Everybody say foundation. Psalm 103. And verse 1 through 3. I just want to show you this. See, a lot of times, let me, let me give you an example of something that's not a foundation. But it's a very powerful truth and it's a very good, good, good thing. Healing is not a foundation. But it's very true. But if the foundation, if you're established in the foundation, which is righteousness by faith, then part of your structure, your house, which is healing, becomes more appro you know, appropriated. That's the word I'm looking for. But look at this. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. I'm just going to do three verses here. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. So bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Next verse. Notice what his benefits are. He forgives all thine iniquities and he heals all thy diseases. Leave that up there. Here's what I want you to see about this verse. It talks about God's benefits and it says he forgives all of your iniquities and he heals all your diseases. He forgives all your iniquities. Notice the order. Forgiveness, then healing. See, I believe forgiveness is, is when you understand faith righteousness and what Jesus has provided that we are righteous because of what Jesus has done then we understand the second one he heals all thy diseases the word there for iniquities has to do in the Hebrew with the condition of guilt it has to do with perversity and all those types of things but one of the definitions it means a state of guilt he, forget, he brings you out of a state of guilt but how many Christians live in a state of guilt? We, can, we manipulate. Family members manipulate other family members with guilt, right? Not in my family. I'm stronger than all the other ones, so I have never have any problem. <laughs> Rick's sitting over there, so I thought I'd throw that in. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but, you know, people do those types. I told you the other couple times about the guilt-free popcorn. And, and, and uh, stuff that people... There's, I look for a day when they'll have stores in the whole guilt-free section. <laughs> Bring me over there, honey. <laughs> guilt-free section. I mean, think about that. People do things, and the Bible says in Romans 14, happy is he that condemns not himself in that which he allows. We talk about it. Man, if you're going to eat a Dairy Queen blizzard, eat it and enjoy it. Don't feel guilty with every... Peanut butter blizzard, Reese cup blizzard. Don't feel guilty. I'll tell you what I like. With every bite, enjoy it. Amen? Amen. But I think that's interesting. He forgives all thine iniquities. And then notice what follows. He heals all thy diseases. See, I think a lot of diseases and sicknesses are rooted in guilt. We have not really settled the righteousness issue and the forgiveness and the remission of sin issue in our heart. It can't be just a doctrine. Psalm 119, verse 130 says, The entrance of thy word gives light. It gives understanding of the, unto the simple. And it literally, I think the Amplified Bible says, The unfolding of your word gives light. Amen. When the word is unfolded, when you see it in your heart, when it becomes a revelation to you. Now, I have not forgot about the sin unto death. We're going to get there. Amen. Oh, I'm looking at my time. I'm doing great. Let me give you just a couple things. I just want to... Quick differences between law and grace. This is going to bring us up to the... Uh, the sin unto death. What is the sin unto death? Some quick differences. Number one, law points you to yourself. Never forget that. That's why Galatians 3, I believe it's verse 12, 11 or 12 says, the law is not a faith because it points you to you. The Mosaic law was given by God. A lot of times when we say law, we're not talking about just the Mosaic law, which was given to Israel. We can be. 
But we're talking about all the laws that churches put on people and people put on people and we put on ourselves. All these things, external standards point you to yourself. Now, we are not lawless. We, that's why the Bible says we are, in Romans 8, 2, we have a higher law. It's the law or the standard of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. In other words, our governing principle comes from our new nature and the Holy Spirit through our new nature. Amen? That's my phone. It whistles. All right? So, so we are not lawless. But grace points you to Jesus. Amen? We're going to get into this when we discuss grace because I really want to get into... Um, like we've never discussed grace before. But grace is so much more than just unmerited favor. It is that, but it's so much more. Amen? And when you, the more you understand that, the more you receive that, and the more you're empowered to follow what God has told you. But law points you to yourself. Grace points you to Jesus. That's why I, called, I, I put out there license to win. So people say, oh, that grace, that's a license to sin. No, true grace is a license to win. Amen? False grace that's been turned into licentiousness or lasciviousness or unbridled lust, that is something, that's totally different. That's a perversion of grace. That is not grace. Amen. That's important. Let me just give you a couple things uh, uh, differentiate between uh, law and grace. Under the law, no flesh was justified. Under the law, no one could be justified. Let's look at it in... Um, Oh, Romans chapter 3, verse 20, maybe 21. Under the law, nobody could be justified. And justified, the word justified, if you're taking notes, write this down. Justified means to be declared righteous. Under all the laws that God gave. See, if people could be justified under the Old Testament, then Jesus would have never had to come. Think about it. If people could be justified by keeping all the laws that God gave, the 613 laws, more than just 10 commandments, then Jesus would have never had to come. This is going to get good, guys. Hang with me. We're, we're bringing you up to what is the sin unto death. Okay? Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified or made righteous or declared righteous in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. By the law is the knowledge of sin. See, the Bible says in Romans 1, 16 and 17, Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation, which is not just missing hell and going to heaven. That's a part of it, but that's not... I mean, it's, it's being delivered, being preserved, being preserved from danger, on and on. Okay? It's, it's the power unto everyone that believes. Not to everyone. You've got to believe it. It's available to everyone. But you've got to believe it. Unto the Jew first and also unto the Greek. And verse 17 says, For therein, wherein the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now watch this. Notice what's revealed by the gospel. The righteousness of God. Not the righteousness of man. Isaiah says our righteousness is filthy rags. Isaiah 64, 6. The Amplified Bible is more explicit. <laughs> okay? But our, listen, it, the gospel does not reveal the righteousness of man. The gospel does not reveal the sinfulness of man. The law does that. See, that's why he says, look at it. For by the law is the knowledge of righteousness. No, of sin. Amen. I, I've used this example many times, but it, it, it's powerful. You don't go in your attic and turn a light on and say, wow, look how much dust this light brought. Do you do that? Anybody do that? 1-800 padded truck, somebody died. <laughs> Nobody does that. The light merely reveals what's already there, correct? Now watch this. So, so the, what the law did, under, under the law, no flesh was justified, and the law, uh, uh, under the law was the knowledge of sin. Under grace, we are made righteous. Let me show you this scripture out of Proverbs 17, verse 20. I'm only going to do a couple of these. I am watching my time. We are going to get to 1 John 5 here in a few. Look at this. This is a powerful verse. He that hath a froward, that word froward heart, froward means a perverse, crooked heart, and also means a heart that doesn't understand righteousness. It contains the idea for you and I as New Covenant believers 
Notice what it says. If your heart is not established in righteousness as a new covenant believer, finds no good. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? Isn't that something? A froward, perverse heart finds no good, and, it go, and, that, and, the, and he that hath a perverse tongue falls into mischief. Notice it talks about the heart, then the mouth. Many times we try to change the mouth to change the heart. If the heart's changed, the mouth will change. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. So under grace, you are made righteous. There's many verses we could go to that. Under the law, it's the knowledge of self. Under grace is the knowledge of Jesus. I'm just trying to get you to see some basic differences before we go look at the sin unto death. See, if the law, I said it earlier, if the law could make you righteous, you wouldn't need Jesus. Hey, let, me, let me describe it to you this way. Let me give you an example. You know, some people think because they're pretty good that, you know, somehow they, yeah, I'm, I'm not as bad as this old publican over here. I'm, I'm not this. But imagine if you were a really great long jumper and you could really jump far. And that's awesome, man. You can jump from here to that wall. I mean, you are just, you got like a frog, man. You can really, really jump. But, you know, I guarantee you, you cannot jump the Grand Canyon. God's standard's so high, no one could ever measure up, except there was one that measured up, and his name was Jesus. See, he measured up for us. Hallelujah. That's why you can smile. That's why you can breathe light, because he measured up for us. You don't have to be condemned. See, there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. Condemnation means threat of judgment. There's no threat of judgment because you're in Jesus. Now, you can do dumb things and mess your life up in the natural, but as far as God's concerned, if you're in Him, He sees perfection. That's why it's good news. Whew, I get so happy. <laughs> so good. Hallelujah. So under the law is the knowledge of Jesus. Let me give you just a couple more. <clears throat> Let me just say this about the law. The law did not strengthen man's battle against sin. The law strengthened sin's battle against man. Can you hear that? Law does never, preaching law never strengthens a person's battle against sin. But it always strengthens sin's battle against the person. That's why when, you, when law is preached hard, you're going to find lots of sin. It's usually secret though. Churches that preach intense law, you take it to the bank, I told it to you, there's a lot of sexual sin going on. Guaranteed. It's covered up. How do you know that? Little bird sat on my shoulder. <laughs> because see, law activates sin. Amen. Uh, hallelujah. Law could not give or make us righteous. I talked about that. Let me just show it to you out of Galatians. Chapter 3, verse 21. I'm going to do this one quick. Galatians 3, verse 21. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. Now, now notice what it says. Is the law against the promises of God? No. God gave the law. The law was perfect, Romans 7, 12. But it could not give man life. Because, why? Because the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, around verse 3, that, that the law was weak through the flesh. So that's why you, if, if you preach law to people, you are destined, if, if it's the body of Christ, if I preach law to you, I'm denying who you are in Christ. And what I'm doing is I'm setting you up for intense frustration. You will be frustrated because you never measure up. <laughs> there's only one who ever measured up so my job if you want to use that terminology <clears throat> my work is a work of faith 1 Thessalonians 1 3 and it's a work of faith it's a work to keep my faith in what Jesus did and not in what I'm doing now hang with me so the, uh, <clears throat> the law could not give life or make us righteous grace gives us life and makes us righteous Grace gives it, there's many verses on that. For example, Ephesians 1, 3, where it says we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So, so grace gives us life and makes us righteous. One more and then we're going to go to 1 John 5. This is a powerful one. Are you ready? Say, I'm ready. Okay. 1 Thessalonians 15, 56. This one will rock your world. You wouldn't even know this was in the Bible if I didn't tell you. 
This is what law does. Are you ready? Watch this. This is what law does. First Thessalonians, or first, first Corinthians 15, 56. When I say first Thessalonians, if you got 15 chapters in first Thessalonians, you got a new Bible. <laughs> I know what I meant. Come on. <laughs> the sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. The law, preaching law, actually strengthens sin. Wow. Wow. Then why would God give a law that would strengthen sin? Because he was trying to bring man to the end of himself. So instead of trusting in himself, he would say, you know what? I can't do this. How many people have you ever heard say that over the years? I have. I, I just can't live it. Well, you're right. You never could live it. It's what he's trying to get you to see. This is good news. Now you're ready for the good news. You can glory in your weakness that the power of Christ might tabernacle you. Yeah, I can't live it, but guess what? Someone lived it for you. And if you'll receive him, he'll live it through you. That's the difference. That's the difference. See, we're not lawless. It's the spirit, it says in Galatians 5.18. It says, it says, if you're under... And, uh, if you're led of the Spirit, you're not under the law, or law in Greek, no definite article. If you're led of the Spirit, that life in you, God's not going to lead you to cuss someone out. Amen? Not even your mother-in-law. I'm just kidding. That's a joke. <laughs> My mother-in-law's here. That's a joke. Somebody said, why not father-in-law jokes? That's a good question. Some guy come up with them. I'm sure of it. <laughs> but notice this. The law strengthens sin. Isn't that something? The law actually strengthens sin. Grace, and this is my last one before we go to 1 John uh, verse 5, enables righteousness. Grace flows through righteousness. I'm not going to go there for the sake of time, but Romans 5.21, grace reigns through righteousness. So law strengthens sin, grace enables righteousness. Grace flows through righteousness. Amen. Now, what is the sin unto death? I am glad you asked. First John chapter 5. We're going to begin with verse 16. There's so much here. We'll be bouncing. We'll be uh, mostly in the King James, but we'll be in the Amplified also. Now this is amazing. If any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death. If, if I see my brother. Note, everybody say brother. brother. That means a fellow believer. Adophos in Greece, Greek. In Greece. <laughs> in Greece. Okay. If I, if I see my brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask. The one who sees his brother sin a sin not unto death, he shall ask. And he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. I believe that's praying for the person. Now this is what we're after. There is a sin unto death. And when you see unto, every time you see unto, see it right there? That's the Greek preposition or word pros p-r-o-s and it means toward so there is a sin that's toward death that's facing death that's what it means there is a sin that's facing death before we go any further let's define death what is death it's separation from god yes it's the absence of the presence of god when it says and i'm not going there because of time but in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10, it says, He abolished death. Isn't that interesting? But I happen to, I've done a lot of funerals. I happen to know people still die. It's not what he's talking about. Death means separation from God. If you're born again, you'll never die. You will physically shed this body, and the world will call that death. But you're just going to cross over. Amen. Good news. Amen. You'll never be separated from God ever again. That's death, absence of the presence of God, separation from God. That's what death is. Amen. So he says there is a sin that's facing death, being separated from God. There is a sin that is death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. In other words, I believe, and I'm going to say, I believe there's a time to pray and there's a time to instruct. And sometimes you have to go to that person and, and, you know, there's other things, however the Lord leads. But I'm saying just, well, there, you, like some of these things I say here, I have to say them. They, they need to be said. Because we got this, 
uh, what's, it, what's the word, Kesara, sera, happy-go-lucky, doesn't matter what I hear. We started this off with Mark 4.24 from the Amplified Bible. And boy, I'll tell you what, what you hear is huge. What you, if you're not hearing New Covenant, run like a scalded dog. <laughs> I'm just going to say it. Oh, it doesn't matter. It does matter. I see people that hear some New Covenant and then they hear other stuff and it's just like this. They cannot hear, they cannot hear the New Covenant. It's just like Galatians 3.1 says, they're bewitched, they're under a spell, they can't hear it. They've ingested poison. Amen. And you know, poison works its way into your system. A little leaven leavens the whole lump, Galatians 5.9. So there is, a, I don't say that you pray for it. Uh, next verse. All unrighteousness is sin. In other words, anytime I operate outside of who I am in Christ, that misses the mark. Hamartia in Greek. It misses the mark or it comes short of the glory of God. Amen? Doesn't mean God's rejecting me. He'll never reject me because I'm in Christ. Amen? Are you hearing this? I'm trying to go slow. Because all unrighteousness sin, and there is a sin not facing or unto, same Greek word, pros, death. There is, all unrighteousness sin, and, and there is a sin that doesn't face death. Amen? And the, here, here, let me say this to you. I know we don't like to hear this, but it's the truth. Everybody misses it. Amen. In word, in thought, in deed. I mean, if you want to get technical the way, I mean, just not to him that knows to do good and does it not. To him, it's missing the mark. James 4, 17. But, but see, the church has preached that in an effort to get motivate people to do the right thing. We want people to do the right thing, but doing the right thing on a consistent basis doesn't come from being prodded or condemned. It comes from finding out who I am. Amen. Amen. Once I find out that I can do something, I have no problem doing it, right? When I found out I could enter the pros... No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Moving right along. <laughs> Next verse. Not a good example. Here's, this is a verse we're after. We know, this, this got me. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Now stop. I have a real problem with that. The way people preach that is, well, if you're born of God, you, if you sin, you're not born of God. Anybody ever heard stuff like that? There's other verses in 1 John 3. We're not going there for the sake of time. But I have a problem with that because in verse 16, which we just read, if I see my brother sin. But here he says, if you sin, you're not born of God. We got a contradiction in just, what, three verses? Amen? No, that's not what he's talking about. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not unto death. It can't mean that he never makes a mistake or he's contradicting verse 16. Amen? We're gonna, I'm going to tell you here in, in a few minutes what I believe the sin unto death is. You can disagree with me, but I'm not going to agree with you. We'd both be wrong. I'm just teasing. <laughs> it's simple. We know that whosoever is born of God doesn't sin unto death, but he that is begotten of God keeps himself. Now that's interesting. The word keeps himself is tereo in Greek. T-E-R-E-O. And, and Thayer says that metaphorically it means to keep oneself in the state in which he is. To keep a... I believe for a born-again child of God, for me to keep myself is to stay in the state in which I am, that I am righteous and holy because of the blood of Jesus and I'm in Christ. And sometimes when you sin or miss the mark or you feel like you've been just a big idiot, you think, wow, what is wrong with me? And condemnation wants to get in on you and you say, no, but I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm keeping myself in the state in which I am and I'm not going to let some foolish action on my behalf pull me out of that state and tell me I'm not who he says I am. Are you hearing that? That's good. <laughs> That's good. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not unto death. But he that is begotten or born of God keeps himself, keeps himself in the state in which he is. And I love this. And that wicked one toucheth him not. Now I thought about this. The word toucheth in Greek is haptomai, H-A-P-T-O-M-A-I. And it means to attach oneself to. It means to influence. It means to cling to. It literally means to exercise a modifying influence upon and we'll come back here it means to attach fasten cling to cleave to it means 
to exercise a modifying influence upon. Now watch this. Because this person, us, you and I, born again children of God, we keep ourselves in the state in which we are, the wicked one cannot cling to me and exercise a modifying influence upon me and tell me that I'm not the righteousness of God in Christ because I'm keeping myself in the state of who he says I am. <clears throat> Glory to God. Man, that's good. Man, that's good. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We're going to go on because it does, it, the subject, it gets clear. Let me just say this to you. The sin that faces death or separation from God is the belief that, that sin takes you out of your right standing with God. It's the, it's the belief that it's, it's a sin unto death because you, you don't believe that you're righteous with Him. So that sin faces death and you think in your mind that you're separated from God because of something you've done or something you haven't done. It's a sin that faces death and it tells you that your sin is bigger than the blood of Jesus. That's why it produces death and separate. You're not separate from God, but you can think you are. We'll come right back here. We've got two minutes. Jump over uh, to um, uh, Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, I want to say verse 17. I hope I'm right. Maybe it's verse 18. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye, brethren, that you, brethren, henceforth walk not as other Gentiles, or people who don't know God, that are not born again. He's saying, don't walk this way, implying that I can walk this way. In the vanity of their mind, next verse, having the understanding darkened, they're alienated from the life of God. They walk separate from the life of God. He's saying, you believers, don't walk like you're separate from the life of God. Why? Because it's the ignorance that's in them. Because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness. Or what's the use? Can't live it anyhow. <laughs> right? How many, people, there, how many people are on bar stools today because they couldn't live it? Because the church told him, you saw, I, know, uh, uh, I had a man tell me one time that he was saved, loved the Lord, and, and he was in a church, and he had something happen where he let a cuss word fly out of his mouth, and he went and talked to the preacher and basically said it didn't take. Wow. It didn't take because a cuss word came out of his mouth. Mm. People preach that stuff all the time. Hold on who being past feeling have given themselves over. In other words, they no longer can feel the love and the conviction of God that's convicting them of His love and His grace, not pointing out their faults. God will never point out your faults. He, he will correct you by the word because He loves you. But He's not, when He gets around, He's not trying to say, well, you did this wrong and you did this wrong and you did this wrong. He's going to show you what's right about Jesus and who you're in. And that will deal with the wrong. I'm not saying he'll never point out something, but it's always in love. Okay, to work all uncleanness with greediness. One more verse, and then we'll... Thank you. Watching the time. But ye have not so learned Christ. You didn't learn this from Jesus. This is not how Jesus operates. Amen? All right, now back to 1 John 5, quickly. I'm just about done. The sin unto death is putting your faith in something other than what Jesus did. The sin unto death is putting your faith in something other than what Jesus did. I'm going to quickly go through these verses. I'm not going to do them justice, but I won't. 1 John 5, verse 18 is where we were at. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not unto death. That's, you know, I'm, I'm adding that to clarify with the context. But he does the begotten of God. He keeps himself in the state in which he is. He keeps his faith in what Jesus did. And the wicked one cannot exercise a modifying influence upon him. Next verse. And we know, verse 18, verse 19, verse 20 has, we know, we know, we know. Verse 15 has, we know. We didn't do verse 15. And we know that we are of God. Glory to God. Hear what he's saying? See, the sin unto death is telling you you're not of God. Because facing death and telling you God's separated from you because he's had it with you. I mean, come on. How many times do we got to go over this? That's how we think God is. That's not how he is. See, that's why he says this. We know we're of God. 
we're of God hallelujah of ek means that we're out of God we're birthed out of him that we are of God and the whole world lies in wickedness the whole thing this whole system is telling you do good get good do bad get bad it's based on you 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 the whole system tells you that amen next verse it literally means under the sway of the wicked one under the sway of Satan himself isn't that something and we know that the Son of God has come I, I got to do this one I've got to do this one somebody say I got to do this one okay. <laughs> is come is a phenomenal Greek word I, I wrote this one down uh, is come hiki in Greek and it means uh, it literally means has come I don't like the King James here because we know that the Son of God is come and we, we, we sometimes that's a little vague Literally has come. New King James, Amplified, other translations will tell you that. Here's what it means in the Greek. It means to come to one. It means to seek intimacy with one. We know that the Son of God has come to seek intimacy with you and I. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Do you, can I tell you something about being intimate with someone? You know all about them. You know their faults. You know how their breath smells. Jen will tell you, honey, it's time for me to clean your teeth again. <laughs> she can smell. She's got the nose like a coon dog, I'm telling you. <laughs> she does. I mean, it blows me away. We're driving down the road. He said, there's rabbits down the road. Five. I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> we know that the Son of God has come. He's seeking it. And He has given us. Say, He's given me an understanding that we may know Him that is true. And we are in Him. Look at all this. This is an amazing verse. And we are in Him that is true. We're not trying to get in Him that is true. We're not going in and out of Him that is true. We're in Him that is true. I love that. Even in His Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God. And this is, I'm adding that, eternal life. This is it. Being in. As I tell people, God wants eternal life to start now and continue throughout the ages to come. Amen. All right, one more. And this, this used to bug me to no end. This is where we'll go to the Amplified after I do the King James. We're just about done. For, last verse of the entire book here, of 1 John, verse 21. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. That just... That just seemed like it didn't fit for years. That did not seem like it fit, but it actually fits quite well. <laughs> Imagine that. The Holy Ghost got it right, right? It actually fits quite well. He's talking about the sin unto death. And, and let me tell you what an idol is. An idol is, is anything other than Christ <laughs> or a believer. Let me say, legalism, I love this definition. Legalism has been defined as the idolatry of self. The idolatry of self, legalism. Now watch this from the Amplified. We are just about done. Little children, keep yourselves from idols, false gods, from anything and everything that would occupy the place in your heart due to God, from any sort of substitute for Him that would take first place in your life. Amen. So be it. Now we hear that sometimes in a legalistic term. Well, I'll tell you what. Are you putting your hobbies ahead of God? Are you put That's not what he's saying. He's saying, let God, let what he's done, who he is, let his goodness be the first place in your life. Let your faith be in him and not in anything else. Amen? It's good news for you. It's not like, it's not a condemning, browbeating thing, but it's just saying, let God occupy that place. Anything else, like I said, the sin unto death will always cause you to face away from Christ. That's why it says, un every time you see that there, it's that Greek preposition, pros, and it means towards. That's why it's facing death instead of facing Christ. That's the sin unto death. Amen. Are you blessed? Amen. I'm stopping. We're landing the plane. Attention, uh, flight attendants, prepare for landing. <laughs> We're landing, baby. <laughs> God is good. Give the Lord a hand. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. I can't look at my Bible phone there. I'm walking away. I'm like, oh, I want to share this, but maybe, maybe next week. I'm still meditating on something that it's just... It, God is so good. I'm telling you. When we see what God has done... You know, everything... God has made everything a gift for you and I, including faith. 
Amen. You know, a lot of times we're trying to put faith in our ability rather than faith in his faith. Boy, that, I'm getting into something. Amen. It's easy when we realize that Jesus, I, I'm meditating on this right now. Jesus is the one who believes for me. Ah, I just have to believe that he's believing for me. See, it ain't my effort. It's what he did. Amen. Everything starts with being born again. If you're not born again, you must be born, or as they say down south, born, to, born again. I just read, I got this thing in my office called, you might be a redneck if, it cracks me up, some people don't like it. I just, the one for this weekend is that you might be a redneck if you've ever hurt yourself belching. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I have. <laughs> I thought it was funny. Ron and Kelly gave it to me, so anyhow. So if anybody here, if you've never been born again, I want to give you that opportunity. It's a very serious thing. Amen? You, when you accept Jesus, who is that? Oh, I was talking to someone recently, and they were, they were in a particular uh, religious group, and they said that uh, this, this one uh, uh, minister came there, and he started talking about being born again, and they go, they didn't, well, we want that. And they went up, and they did it, and they were in this structure where they don't preach born again. And uh, uh, something really changed after that. When you say yes to Jesus, he comes in. Amen? He's waiting to come. He loves you so much. He loves the world. And I know most of the people here are born again, but I like to uh, say a prayer. And just You have to believe it in your heart. You don't even have to say my exact words. Amen? Just believe in your heart. It's not about a form. It's about a heart condition. Amen? So just say, Dear Jesus, I receive you now as my Lord and Savior. I believe in my heart that you died for my sins. And that on the third day, you were raised from the dead for my justification. I accept you now as my Lord and Savior. Amen. And another thing we like to talk about here is the baptism in the Holy Ghost. And that comes we, here again. Infilling, baptism, I have heard all that. I don't get hung up on all that. There's a second work of grace. And God wants to empower us. God, How many of you ever prayed and you have no clue how to pray? That's my hand's... Both hands. If I had three hands, I'd put them up, or four. <laughs> That's most of my prayers. But I've discovered that the Holy Ghost knows how to pray perfect prayers through me. He wants us to get past this and out of who we are in Christ. So if you've never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. And I'm, well, I'm going to release everyone. Uh, uh, so others can, I believe, strongly in fellowship. But I want stick around, and we will pray with you. And also, healing. Everybody say Healing. Healing is for today. God wants you well. Amen? And we want to pray with you. It's something that I just learned recently, and it's so simple, uh, uh, that really blessed me. Andrew Womack was talking about so many times we pray for people, and we don't find out what they're believing for. You can't do that. That rocked me. I was just simple. And I've heard it before. But you know how you hear something, and all of a sudden one day you hear it? You can't. I can't just override. Just like, I can't, oh, I'm praying for so-and-so to get saved. Well, what are they believing for? I can't do that and get somebody born again against their will. And it's the same with healing. Where are they at? They may be believing God for, for the, uh, God's hands on the doctor. That's, and that's fine. But where are they believing? So I'm learning. Anybody else learning or am I the only one? So if there's anybody desires prayer for anything, I'm going to ask you, Mark? I had a couple of friends pass away Friday. I'd like to okay. remember the family. Tim Stevenson, 46 years old. Amen. Wow. Michael Pohl, I was 58. Wow. And two children and wife both passed away Friday at Wow. Born again? Yeah. Born again. We lift up this family in the name of Jesus. We release the comforting power of the Holy Spirit on this family. In Jesus' name, amen. Anybody else? It's earlier than it's ever been. No football games today. I like to say that. Hold on. Some of you guys have... George? Huh? Oh, the racism. <laughs> you knew it would be some deep theological thing coming from George. Some of you guys haven't seen it yet. I've jumped off the deep end. I'm kidding. I'm not really a fan. It's just I'm a friend of Rich, and he makes me like him. So <laughs> we're blessed, amen? Hug somebody. Hey, don't. I know sometimes you've got to get going. I understand that. But if you can hang out and just, who's God leading you to bless?
just by a smile or a hug or something. Amen? God bless. Thank you.